So good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Juliana Ranches. I'm assistant professor and beef extension specialist with Oregon State University. And I'm based in Eastern Oregon at the uh, Burns Research Center. Uh, it's a pleasure to be organizing this webinar series. Our main goal is to provide information and discuss about wildfires with focus on preparedness prior to fire season and how to uh, care for livestock during, during and after wildfire or during smoke exposure. This webinar series are part of a larger grant funded by USDA NEPA, which focus primarily on how wildfire smoke exposure impact animal health and performance. Um, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Katie Poston. Um, Katie is assistant professor and rangeland fire specialist at Oregon State University. And she's also based uh, at the URC in Burns. Tonight, she'll be talking about getting ready for the fire season, specifically how to uh, prepare your range in operation for this, the fire season. Uh, she will be answering questions at the end of the talk, so please type your questions at any time in the Q&A uh, box, which should be at the bottom of your screen, okay? Katie, thank you very much for being part of this group and for being with us tonight, uh, and welcome. Thanks, Juliana, and thanks everyone for coming out this evening. I know it's a busy time of year. Uh, and so tonight we're going to talk about preparing for fire season when you're a livestock operator. And I think most folks here know that it's a lot more complicated uh, when you're a livestock producer getting ready for fire season than for maybe typical homeowners, um, along with tending to, you know, creating defensible space around your homes. Uh, producers are also thinking about risk reduction on really large tracts of land um, and then also protecting their herds and forage and ranch infrastructure when, when fires do occur. Many ranches have livestock in multiple locations, and often this is, you know, far away, especially during summer, which is when we get our fires. Uh, so tonight I was going to discuss a few things that livestock producers can do to get ready for fire season. Um, but first, I wanted to do a little bit of an interactive activity. I know sometimes being on Zoom can be boring. Um, and so I want to uh, pose a question to you. And I guess I uh, stopped sharing my slides a little bit <laughs> early there. Um, let's see if it'll... There we go. Uh, so I want to hear from you all about what you worry about when it comes to fire season. Uh, so if you have a smartphone, you could scan this QR code, um, or I'm going to put a link in the chat that can take you directly there. Um, and you can, you know, just, just use a couple words, um, just like to see what's on your mind before we dive into some content tonight. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. So it looks like already you guys are, you know, entering in some of those thoughts you have. If you're just joining us tonight, um, I will share a link with you in the chat. And I've posed the question uh, to folks here. Just I want to hear what's on your mind when it comes to fire season. And Juliana and Jennifer and Amy, you're welcome to add your thoughts as well. Well, feel free to keep adding to this today. Appreciate you all, uh, you know, just thinking about it. I want to recognize that, um, you know, thinking about fire, threatening property, homes, your animals, um, that can be a difficult thing sometimes. Um, and yeah, I, I'm thinking here, so I see home is the big one. So the larger the, the letters, the more people say that. Um, and I'm guessing that's more than just the house, right? It's it's the ranch operation. And so we're gonna be talking about that, that space here tonight. Well, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna get back to PowerPoint if I can find it again, there it is. 
And so today I'm going to talk about um, a couple different things. We're going to start with just some basics about FHIR. Some of you may be familiar, some of you may not, um, but we're going to be focused um, really narrowly on what factors are within our control. I know you all have a lot going on uh, running a livestock operation, and, and so focusing on those, those things that you can control is, is the key here. I'm mostly going to be talking about before fire tonight, and that's going to be both short-term and long-term activities. Um, so the first of these are our options when it comes to fuels management. Um, and then importantly, I'm going to give you a whole lot of options and it can feel overwhelming. And so what management activities should be prioritized at your place? And then a big piece of this is, is making a plan. And this is where we kind of transition to thinking about, you know, when a fire occurs, what am I going to be doing? What's my family going to be doing? What are, what are we going to be talking about as, as a unit? And so getting to that first question about what drives fire, what's within our sphere of control. Um, so a couple of things, and again, some of you might be well familiar with this, um, a combination of fuel characteristics and then also environmental conditions. So things like, has it rained recently? What's the temperature outside, the elevation you're at? All these together um, inform what we call fuel condition which is the relative flammability of a piece of fuel. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. Um, but the other things, um, when it comes to whether a fire starts and how that fire behaves on a landscape, um, are also weather and then also topography. And so thinking about, you know, it is super important to be aware of day-to-day -day conditions, so weather, and I know you're all checking it a lot, um, you know, maybe we want to limit our activities that risk starting a fire, um, and then also I think a lot of you are aware of topography too, and so when there's a fire, um, it's going to influence how quickly that fire might reach uh, a, a place on the landscape or the road you're on, um, it'll inform evacuation routes. But we can't really control weather and topography. And the main thing that we can control are fuel characteristics, the extent to which we have fuels and easy, easily ignitable fuels on our property is, is the big thing that's under our sphere of influence before a fire starts. And so what is fuel? Um, I, I think a lot of us are joining from different places tonight. Um, I'm in southeastern Oregon, so we're talking about sagebrush rangelands, but I recognize that this can be different depending on where you are. Uh, so generally, fuel is any combustible material, anything that can burn. So that could be a lot of things. Uh, in rangeland systems, we're talking about vegetation. There are a few structures. And for our purposes tonight, we're just concerned about basically two two fuel types. Uh, we have woody fuels, and so those are going to be your conifers. We have an awful lot of western juniper here. Um, and then also brush, so sagebrush, rabbit brush, bitter brush. And then in contrast, we have fine fuels. Um, and so those are those are going to be mostly your grasses. And so for us, those are native bunch grasses. Uh, we have a lot of annual grasses. We're going to talk a lot about those tonight. And the reason it's important to distinguish between these two types of fuels is they uh, function differently when fires on the landscape. So fine fuels are really good at quickly carrying fire across a landscape or from shrub to shrub. Uh, they don't burn very long, but they're really good at carrying that fire, at transmitting fire. Uh, in general, when these woodier fuels ignite, they burn long and hot. We're going to talk a bit more about what this means in a few slides. And so just to give you some really basic fuel characteristics, uh, so we all have a working understanding tonight. Uh, the reason this is important um, is because it provides the rationale for what fuels you might worry about during fire season and what you might want to do about them. And so the first fuel characteristic uh, that we're going to discuss is fuel arrangement. This is how plants, how those fuels are distributed, um, and it determines how quickly or if at all a fire can spread. And so this is called fuel continuity. Uh, if fuels are really dense, so we, you have high horizontal fuel continuity if each piece of fuel is touching, um, these fuels, um, they can more easily carry fire and spread it. And so if we take a look at these photos here, uh, this photo on top 
has that high fuel continuity. The plants are all touching and the fire can really readily be carried through that fuel bed. Um, that really light colored grass is a great way to carry fire. Uh, but this photo below, um, you can see that there's actually bare ground between plants. Uh, for those of you familiar with sagebrush steppe, um, you know, this is fairly normal. It's created by those native bunch grasses um, and then also the shrubs in there. And so in general, uh, we recommend that folks manage their range for more of that bunch grass component or plant species like crested wheatgrass, where you actually have large inner spaces between the plants with the idea that this slows the spread of fire. Obviously when you have high wind events, that's you know kind of negated, but, but in general, this prevents um, maybe a spark coming off a road from really rapidly moving through a bed of fuel on your roadside. When you have a site with shrubs or junipers, so remember those are our woody fuels, um, there may be fewer ground fuels carrying fires, and so we call that less horizontal fuel continuity. Um, but if those heavy woody fuels ignite, you actually have a different kind of problem. And this is related to the chemical composition of these fuels. And so some plants like sagebrush and juniper where we are, uh, they have high amounts of oils in their leaves. And what this means is they put off a lot of sparks and embers when they burn. And so this actually contributes to greater um, fire spread and it can potentially be quite dangerous for wildland firefighters. And so those firefighters may fight those kinds of fires uh, less, less aggressively. They'll do an indirect attack where they're away from that fire line because the flame lengths are too large. Uh, if you're worried about rangeland health as well, which you might be if you're in the business of uh, raising livestock, um, you're also worried about um, the chemical composition of these shrubs because the uh, what we call the residence time, so how long it takes for these fuels to burn, uh, it's quite long and these fires burn quite hot. And uh, one study at, here at the Eastern Oregon Agricultural Research Center actually found that within the drip line of a shrub, so within the immediate area of where that shrub canopy is, 90% of perennial bunch grasses were killed by fire um, because of this hot burning sagebrush. And so this contributes to what we call a higher burn severity. And the reason that might be important when we're just thinking about kind of long-term things is it actually makes post-fire restoration um, far more difficult. It can zap your soil and even negate your seed bank. And so what we find here with a lot of annual grasses is that kind of disturbance is a great opportunity for those, those grasses to colonize um, that bare soil. And so Lastly, on the topic of chemical composition, uh, one thing we see in Central and Eastern Oregon in particular is that people might like to line their driveways with trees like junipers or have some trees around their home for shade. And while that's lovely, uh, one thing we want to be thinking about is that if the canopies of these trees ignite, if we get crown fires, um, they increase the chances of, again, they spark, they put off a lot of embers. Um, and so you might get embers on the roof of your home or your barn. And embers are the main cause of structure ignitions, not a flaming front, the actual wildfire reaching the home. And so worth, worth a thought uh, about, you know, how these fuels are arranged um, around your home or important buildings on the property. The last uh, fuel characteristic that's important for our purposes today is fuel moisture. Uh, and fuel moisture is just the amount of heat required for a piece of fuel to ignite and burn. It takes a little bit of preheating to get to that point. And it depends on the type of fuel and again, things like how wet it is um, that determines how long that takes. And so usually when fire and fuel pe fuels people talk about fuel moisture, um, they're probably talking about, you know, how much moisture is retained by a large log versus a small piece of grass. Uh, but for range and ag lands, uh, we're mostly talking about the fuel moisture of, of different grasses. Um, in particular, and I have an arrow here, uh, we're, we're thinking about those invasive annual grasses. So they dry out much earlier than native grasses. I think most of you are familiar with that. Um, and studies have found that native perennial bunch grasses um, in the Northern Great Basin 
they actually stay green longer than invasive annual grasses by three weeks. That's that's quite a long time because what that functionally means is that if you have a pasture of mostly invasive annual grasses, your fire season, the potential for an ember to easily ignite that fuel bed is actually three weeks longer than if it were one of those native bunch grass species. And so why does all this matter? Why did we learn about some fuel characteristics tonight? So fuel characteristics influence the likelihood that a fire will start when there's an ignition, how that fire will behave once it gets going, uh, how severe it is. And then something we won't talk about tonight is how frequently you'll subsequently experience those fires. So it matters a lot. And so we're gonna be thinking about this throughout the night um, in terms of um, our management activities and what we choose to do and where on our ranch and um, farm properties. So why treat fuels? So managing your fuels is the best way to manage your fire risk. And then we're also gonna talk about how it's good to have a plan. Um, and so for the next few slides, um, I'm going to talk about different ways you can manage the different fuels on your property, uh, again, to decrease the probability of fire, so reduce your risk of fire, um, and then also kind of moderate that fire behavior in the immediate or important areas on your ranch. And then the treatments uh, we talk about are going to depend on plant community characteristics, what your operations like, your management objectives, um, and then obviously we all have uh, logistical constraints. And so we'll just talk about some options for um, treating invasive annual grasses, promoting perennial bunch grasses, uh, thoughts for managing hazardous fuels, uh, and then also fuel breaks. But also keep in mind, this is a broad audience. I know everyone's property is different. We're all in different ecosystems. And so some, some stuff will apply and, and some won't. And so first, you know, going back to those fuel characteristics. So we talked about fuel continuity, having high fuel continuity, really high fuel loadings um, can be a problem. First, it increases the likelihood that an ignition will start a fire, but it also increases the probability that if there's an ignition, that fire is gonna quickly spread. Um, and you can easily see that in this photo here. I took this um, Southwest of Boise near Mountain Home, and that is, an entire pasture of Medusa head. And you can imagine if there were uh, a spark, you know, coming off a vehicle on the road, um, that would probably light up pretty easily. And again, this is due to those fuel characteristics we just talked about. So really low fuel moisture in those annuals. Um, that's contiguous, really fast burning fuels. Remember those grasses really easily carry fire across the landscape. And so if you have an untreated infestation like this, um, you're gonna have this litter accumulating year after year after year, if you don't graze it, um, and you're gonna have really high field loads. And so first order of business, we wanna reduce invasive annual grasses. And so we're gonna think about seed dispersal. Uh, so you might do this by applying selective herbicides. Um, so pre-emergent herbicides in the fall will minimize damage if you do have a perennial component in that pasture. Uh, you could prescribe burn in the fall, but you would absolutely want to treat with an herbicide because uh, you're going to have all that bare ground. There's presumably a seed bank. Um, and so you're going to want to reseed with something competitive. Otherwise, that was a waste of everyone's time and potentially forage. Uh, does a great job clearing out that pasture, though. Um, seeding around the infestations, if you have a smaller one, it can reduce spread um, to, to other places as long as you're not trotting through it and carrying it around. Uh, so crested wheatgrass competes well with cheatgrass and, and can exclude it over time. And then you want to try your best to reduce vehicle, animal, human contact with the seeds. Uh, so if you're in a pasture like this, you absolutely want to carefully brush off your boots and clothing. Um, and this is really hard. I want to acknowledge this is hard if you're grazing these fields uh, because your animals are obviously moving from an infestation to potentially a non-infested area. So if you can, uh, try and not move livestock directly from a field like this to an uninvaded area. Um, ideally, your rotation would hit an infested site like this before the seeds are dispersed. Um, this could help you make a dent in the seed bank. And then it's a good idea, not always feasible, uh, to, to try and maintain invasive annual grass-free zones 
maybe using herbicide um, along your roads and trails. Because again, you're just trying to reduce the dispersal of those seeds. It's also good to try and detect infestations early. Uh, so take a look at your property, take a look along roads, maybe cow trails. Um, if you're really an overachiever, random locations are great. Uh, keeping in mind that roads are the most likely vector pathway for spread into new areas. And then also, you know, look near existing infestations. Um, so recently disturbed areas, maybe you had some heavy equipment somewhere or you're holding livestock in an area. And those new infestations, especially in uninvaded areas, so places you've never seen invasive annual grasses before, um, those should be a priority for eradication. You can still get that under control if it is early on. And so it's a good idea to routinely monitor treated areas, um, you know, find out if retreatment is necessary. Um, and then in terms of the long term, and so this is a multi-year endeavor, perhaps your whole life, um, you know, over time, you want to be thinking about uh, maintaining or increasing plant community resistance to invasion. So again, part of that is just preventing infestation, treating those new infestations. Um, but the other piece of this, uh, which is hard, is just making sure these don't burn in severe fires. Uh, and so We'll talk about that a bit, but minimizing disturbance is, is generally helpful. Um, grazing, uh, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. So some plant communities, some sites are more resistant to invasive annual grasses than others. They can compete with them. Um, and high perennial bunch grass abundance reduces the ability of invasives to establish. So this is on those along those lines of kind of that long-term rangeland resilience that we're we're all striving for. Um, so reviewing uh, fuel characteristics, so fuel continuity. Why do you want perennial grasses rather than annuals? So first off, they stay green longer. So that's a fuel moisture conversation that we'll get to in a moment. Um, but also those perennial grasses uh, just naturally create those larger inner spaces. And so your fuel loading in at a site with perennial bunch grasses versus cheatgrass, uh, it's considerably lower with the native species. And what that means is fire will move less uh, quickly. Uh, so it's less likely to start, but it'll also move less quickly through that fuel bed. And so that can be helpful. And so how do you maintain or increase plant community resistance? Uh, this is a tricky thing. If we like, if we knew how to do it perfectly, we wouldn't have problems, right? So the first step is to just minimize disturbance. So um, construction, um, non-selective herbicides. Again, this increases the probability of invasion because uh, those annuals really love that disturbed bare ground. Um, and so if there's a disturbance like a fire and you know there's a chance it'll come back as invasives, maybe because you saw some there before it burned, uh, you might want to reseed with something that can compete. Uh, so drill seeding an introduced mix of crested and Siberian wheatgrass could potentially kind of stave off invasion and then promote establishment of perennials. Um, but also, perhaps of interest to this audience, um, you know, we multiple studies have shown that livestock grazing can be useful to both treat invasives, so again, reducing that fuel continuity, reducing that fuel load, um, but also decreasing fire risk. Uh, so first, uh, an EOARC study from a few years ago uh, found that perennial bunch grasses were 200% more likely to burn if they had not been grazed compared with plots that had been grazed by cattle in the spring. And this is because uh, when you graze grass, you're removing fuel. Some of that fuel is uh, kind of senesced standing dead fuel. Um, so it has low fuel moisture, um, but you're also just reducing fuel loads on the landscape compared with not grazing, right? Uh, if you're growing during the growing season, you wanna do it moderately. Um, avoid repeat overuse um, and incorporate some rest that goes to that disturbance conversation. Um, but other studies have also found that fall and winter cattle grazing increases fuel moisture during the following fire season, which is 
of great interest, right? So I'd reference kind of those dead stems that build up. All of us have seen this in the centers of ungrazed bunch grasses over multiple growing seasons. And so what this means is overall, uh, that is drier fuel in the earlier in the fire season, uh, just because you have more standing or you have more dead biomass in, in those clumps of grass, right? So grazing can remove that standing dead litter. This increases the overall moisture content. And what this means is that fuel moisture lasts longer and decreases later in the fire season. And so in the graph on this slide, that's that red dotted line. Um, that is um, when fuel would readily ignite and burn. And so you can see that um, top line with the open circles, the winter grazed plots, um, they don't dip below that line until mid August, which is astonishing. Um, this isn't a fireproof, uh, pun intended, <laughs> plan, um, but it sure is better than leaving a lot of, um, you know, dead fuel on the landscape the entirety of the fire season. Uh, fall winter grazing doesn't need to happen every year, um, and so you'll want to be set up where you have alternative pastures if you want to try this practice. The next thing is just managing hazardous fuels. So hazardous fuels are those that burn intensely and produce large flame lengths. They increase risk of spot fires. And so those are additional fires that um, fire resources need to go deal with. Um, and those large flame lengths also, as I mentioned earlier before, are just challenging for fire responders. Um, to, to It just is less safe to directly attack. Um, and so how intent should you be on removing plants such as juniper and sagebrush? Uh, this depends on your management objectives. So first, for us, uh, if these highly volatile fuels that burn hot with big flames, um, if they're near your structures and you're determined to keep them, uh, maybe make sure they aren't in dense clusters. Uh, they can get burning quite hot, and you really don't want that um, kind of transmitting you know, up a driveway to your home, for example. Uh, if you remove junipers and shrubs, you might be opening up areas for herbaceous fuels. Um, this is fine. Remember, these burn with lower severity, but they still spread fire. So just keep that in mind. Um, so the treatment you choose uh, should reflect your objective um, and then also the plant community you're dealing with. And so if you have a lot of annual grasses around and you're going to be removing sagebrush or juniper, Assume you're probably going to encourage more annual grasses because you'll be disturbing that land. Uh, so you have several treatment options. Um, prescribed fire is really good for thinning juniper. It actually can uh, make a dent in the seed bank if you're struggling with, with an awful lot of juniper. Um, you know, especially if the shrub and herbaceous component at your site is in good shape, um, prescribed fire might be a good choice because it will recover um, after you open up that canopy. Um, and plus, you'll get some good grass growth in the following season. We have a lot of mechanical uh, treatment options available too. Uh, so uh, manually cutting juniper, but also masticating feller bunchers. These miss small seedlings. Um, and then again, you want to think about the impact, the disturbance to the soil. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a balancing act, right? Reducing your hazardous fuels, maybe increasing annual grasses. It depends where that is on your land. Um, you know, I would recommend you don't want hazardous fuels around your home, around your structures, um, maybe along roads that might be used for fire response because you don't want fire responders to, you know, potentially have a wall of flames uh, next to their engines. Uh, you could also explore some chemical treatments, and so I encourage you to ask your local, um, you know, SWCD or CWMA office to find out what they recommend. Um, and just always be thinking, sorry about that, mm, it's not going back, there we go. Uh, just always be thinking about post-treatment needs, right, and, and how long you need to, um, how long until you need to consider retreating af after you um, undertake some of these. So another option uh, are strategic fuel modifications in a really specific area. This is known as fuel breaks. 
The purpose of fuel brakes are to disrupt fuel continuity and reduce fuel loads. Uh, you can do this using grazing, mowing, disking, spraying, anything that removes or rearrange fuels. And so thinking back to the fuel characteristics, this is, we wanna rearrange fuels. We wanna take them uh, from something high and potentially hazardous producing large flames to something low uh, and producing small flames. Uh, we're also reducing hazardous fuels, removing volatile fuels. And so this is what I was just referencing with cutting juniper. Maybe you want to mow your sage or rabbit brush. Again, you're thinking about reducing the potential flame length if you have fires in these areas. So again, these are in strategic places um, and also reducing that rate of spread. Um, and so which fuel characteristic is this going back to? We're thinking about the chemical composition of those fuels. And so getting the ones out that are gonna be pretty hazardous uh, to have around when you have a fire is, is the thinking here. Uh, you could increase fuel moisture by seeding species that stay greener later into the fire season. Uh, so fuel characteristic, this is that fuel moisture conversation. And so, uh, if you do these things, um, fuel breaks may decrease the probability of fire starts. So this is especially helpful uh, along kind of heavily trafficked roadways. Um, a lot of us have kind of these roads in our communities that didn't used to be heavily traveled, and now we're seeing quite quite a lot more vehicles than we used to. Um, Fuel breaks also reduce fire behavior. So again, when you're mod you're either reducing or modifying the characteristics of the fuels, the idea is these fuel breaks won't necessarily stop a fire, but they will certainly make it a heck of a lot easier and safer to engage that fire. And so along those lines, fuel breaks are a really important tool for, for wildland fire response. So they can either engage a fire from there um, or they can use those as a um, tactical decision space um, when they're figuring out a plan of attack. And so in this photo, um, and this is an extreme example, this is uh, from uh, near Mountain Home, once again, um, the road and then the roadside treatment together disrupts fuel continuity like for a significant width, right? And so you can see that they removed the sagebrush. Um, and so if there were to be a fire, you're going to have a reduced rate of spread and like tiny or non-existent flame lakes, especially where we have bare soil, keeping in mind that that's going to have to be uh, treated fairly regularly. And, you know, a bonus here, as I mentioned, was a lot of human cause ignitions come off the road. And so this, when we think about if there's a, you know, someone has a flat or is dragging chains and a spark, uh, you know, comes off the road and it lands in the, the bare soil, uh, you're not going to have a fire start. And so another thought uh, is it's just good to tidy up your roadsides, maybe along your ranch roads or long driveways, especially where you haul a lot of equipment, um, just to make sure that something like that doesn't happen where a spark lands on something extremely flammable, like, like those invasive grasses we've been talking about. Here are several examples of, you know, what constitutes a fuel break. This could be a bunch of different things. So maintain roads. So the one, uh, the photo I just showed you, but it could be a two track, um, a mode area, a disc area that you treat annually um, or vegetative green strips. And the width of any fuel break depends on the fuel type, the topography, the slope. Um, and so we're all just thinking about, you know, what are the potential flame lengths and then just what can we do to knock those down? Um, and so uh, here in the center here, we have a photo uh, my colleague Jacob Powell took. And this is just, you know, to reduce roadside ignitions, right? So they mowed the field here um, and you can see where the stuff is, um, you know, quite a lot taller. And so you would expect, uh, you know, more dramatic fire behavior in that taller bed of fuel than where it's been mowed. Uh, if you mow a disc, uh, so we have a photo here, um, and here we had some sagebrush mowing. You might want to follow up with some chemical treatments if there's a chance that invasive annual grasses will move in. Um, and mowing is required at least annually for grasses. Um, though, if you have the ability to keep animals concentrated in a strip, uh, livestock grazing is an excellent treatment. 
In sagebrush, um, where you're not worried about those invasive annuals, um, mowing is probably only needed once every five years. And again, the thought is just to keep shrubs low. Um, we're, we're taking kind of big shrubs, modifying those fuels, rearranging them just so they're a little bit lower. Then the green strips here in the upper right, um, they're created by seeding some kind of fire resistant species. Uh, so Boise BLM plants forage kochia, and this stays green, it excludes invasives. Uh, it creates a lot of bare ground between plants. It's also palatable for, for some livestock. Other options uh, can include crested or Siberian wheatgrass, sandburn bluegrass, um, alfalfa, if that's something you're growing. And, and basically you wanna select species that readily establish and persist wherever you are, um, but also that they're difficult to ignite, right? So something that stays green certainly longer um, than some of your other species. Um, and then maybe ideally something that your cows might eat. Um, so crescent wheatgrass is often selected for green strip plantings. Uh, it establishes quickly, reliably. It can compete with weeds and it is palatable. Um, it doesn't mind being grazed and it, it can persist uh, in sagebrush systems. However, if it's not actively mowed or grazed, um, it can produce a significant amount of fuel and fairly low moisture content. So thinking back to those fuel characteristics, you've all seen really big um, kind of wolfy crested wheatgrass. Um, you're gonna just you know have the fire problem you had before because um, those can sure uh, to uh, light up. <laughs> And then this last photo here um, is a good example of like, this is um, in the Sinkwater Mountains near where we are. And right here, probably a great field break along this road. But once you get into this uh, pocket of dense juniper, um, probably not. This is an example of where you'd wanna treat some hazardous fuels because if you want this to function as a safe and effective fuel break, and so that includes you know, fire responders safely deploying on this route, um, they're not gonna want to have those junipers right up along the road. That would translate to a wall of fire and that is not a safe thing. Um, so all this sounds great, but obviously your entire property can't be a fuel break. So I'm gonna talk more about maybe where you might put these or use these strategies um, in combination with other field treatments we discussed. So we extensively discussed options for managing fuels, which is the main thing you can control when it comes to reducing the risk of a fire starting, and then also what fire does once it gets going. This can all be overwhelming, uh, and I know most of you have really extensive properties, so where to start? Be thinking about potential for rapid fire spread. It's gonna affect your ability to respond to the fire, evacuate both people and livestock. That's why we spent so much time discussing fuel characteristics. And so think about how your fire risk, how those fuels, those hazards, how are they distributed on your property? What are you particularly worried about? And so think about where your important assets are. Um, what are the fuel conditions in these areas, uh, surrounding these areas? Are there a lot of hazardous fuels? Is there that high fuel continuity we talked about? And so you would worry about fire quickly moving through that area. And then be thinking about the activities you can do to moderate this expected fire behavior. And so fuel modifications are those treatments or management activities that can moderate fire behavior. We're not gonna be able to stop fire. And so, especially because, you know, weather and all kinds of conditions that are out of control, our best chance is to modify fuels, do fuels management um, and support effective fire response operations. And so a piece of this uh, is creating defensible space. And so this is a buffer of non-combustible material uh, around your home. They recommend the five foot area be fairly clean, uh, not a lot going on there. And then the 30 to 100 feet beyond that to be relatively devoid of combustible fuels, keeping in mind that those blowing embers are what ignite structures. Um, your other assets, so feed, packing boxes, mulch, fuel supplies, um, things that are particularly susceptible to flames and those embers. Uh, you want buffers about 100 feet around those as well. And so thinking about those fuel break practices, that might be a good spot for those. You'll want to clear vegetation around equipment, 
protect forage? Is there a really important pasture? Um, you know, maybe you want to disc around that each year or have the horses out there. Um, also be thinking about creating safe havens for livestock in the event of a fire. And so this can be intensively managed grazing, uh, probably near the ranch house to slow that fire behavior as it gets close to home, uh, around barns, equipment areas. Just be thinking about your assets and how that can complement also your needs for offering a space for livestock. Lastly, keep in mind that you don't have to and probably won't be able to do all the areas at once. Um, so start by formulating a plan for carrying out these activities. Are there some particularly important places um, for your operation? Maybe that's where you start. And so beyond field treatments, what else should you be thinking about before a wildfire threatens your property? So this isn't an exhaustive list, just a couple things to consider over the next few slides. So protecting livestock, I think that's really important for a lot of the people here. So answer a couple questions for your operation. Maybe write down what you have figured out, what you need to figure out. Uh, maybe things you'd like other people to know about your operation, whether that's fire responders or maybe a neighbor, uh, your business partner. And so questions like, are livestock in multiple uh, locations? Are there access issues? Are there narrow roads that might be difficult for a stock trailer to get to, especially if we're thinking about inbound fire response resources? Another question is, are there pastures for your livestock to shelter in place if that is what is needed? or will you plan to evacuate them? Uh, if you need to leave animals in place, you're gonna be thinking about, do they have enough feed and water for several days? You may not be allowed to access them for a period of time. Will the livestock have water if the power goes out? Um, are livestock branded and registered? Things can be really chaotic during and following fires. And so that is certainly something to just check off a list to give you some peace of mind. Uh, and then if you need to move animals, um, you know, where are your loading and unloading facilities? Do you have a plan for gathering livestock under kind of an emergency situation? Um, are your helpers, do they know the road system for accessing pastures? So just questions to consider and work through for your operation. A couple more here, thinking about that fire response. So we talked about fuels management. We talked about planning uh, for your livestock during a fire event. How about that fire response piece? So where are your resources? Most ranches have something to offer. Um, and so think about these questions. What do you need to work on, develop, improve? Uh, so do you have adequate water supplies for maybe wetting down your buildings and facilities? Maybe you're gonna fight some fire. Uh, if you have to pump water, do you have a backup system in case you lose power? That's fairly common during fires. Uh, you may want to consider investing in a backup generator um, or some additional water storage so that engines can draft. And then it's really important to clearly mark water tanks, ponds, other water supplies for, for fire responders. Um, so I, I think this is intuitive for most people since, since a lot of you have heavy equipment, but a hard and durable road surface is needed uh, around those water sources because water tenders and large engines are really heavy. Uh, so they can't be too steep, no wet or loose soil. Uh, keep these sites clear of vegetation and debris that can make access difficult. Um, and so if you have places that are good, like make sure and, and put a sign out for, for them. They really appreciate it. Uh, larger fire engines would need about a 45 foot radius turnaround around the water source. And then important to keep in mind that most engines and tenders are um, able to draft out of a creek, a stock pond, a trough, uh, as little as two feet of water. So again, signs can be a really helpful thing in those situations. Another thing to think about is if you have bridges on your property, um, make sure to um, you know, post load limits and also bridge heights, because um, that can be a really terrible thing for, for someone to get their equipment stuck during, during an emergency situation. And so as you start to kind of answer those, those different questions about your operation, you, you might start to write out a plan for yourself. 
and then also for sharing. And so this is an example um, developed by my colleague Jacob Powell with OSU Extension um, of a ranch identifying access routes, structures, resources for during a fire. Uh, you could add to this a list of important phone numbers, the names of neighbors. Uh, it'd be great to have a map of the pastures, maybe those safe havens where livestock could be held during a fire event. Um, if you have some fuel breaks um, or light fuel areas that you've created, those would be a terrific addition to this. Um, important access roads or ones that fire resources can use. Um, maybe hazardous areas that people should stay away from. And so it can it can be quite detailed and it would give you some peace of mind to have that. But again, it's an important thing to distribute to all the, the different people who might end up on your property during a wildfire. Uh, it could be a really great thing to also inventory your water sources. So capacity, type of pump, is it electrical, gravity fed ga uh, gas? Um, where is it located? Um, and so all of this is really helpful um, for during these, these fire events because um, we don't want to waste fire responders' time with them having to hunt down this information themselves if we can just easily hand it off to them. And so you can share these maps, plans, inventories like that last one, um, you know, like so with fire responders, but also the workers at your place, um, your neighbors, maybe with locations of copies of gate keys or lists of combinations. Um, I know a lot of you are grazing on multiple properties and so you're not always on the home ranch. And so it's also just a really good idea to have a network of people um, sharing information during fire season. And so, you know, having relevant phone numbers for neighboring ranches, who runs the cows or sheep right next to you. Uh, consider a phone tree for when someone sees smoke uh, the sooner that gets called in or, or confirmed um, that, that it's been reported, uh, the better. Do you uh, have dispatches number? Do you know how to report a fire? Um, it can be really good to meet your local fire personnel um, prior to the fire season or prior to that emergency. Um, a lot of them are glad to meet the people who live out there and, and so they know who to go to um, when, they're on their, when they're on your land, for example. Another one that we don't think a ton about is um, maybe make a plan with your range con. Are, are they going to let you know if your far off forest allotment um, has, has a fire? Um, and so how is that going to be communicated? And so certainly something to think about uh, when you're reviewing your permit. And so lastly, during a fire, um, and Juliana and Jennifer tomorrow are going to go into a little more detail about handling livestock during fire events, um, but just generally. You're going to want to keep monitoring what's going on. So watch for smoke nearby. Uh, local radio and TV, check on those weather updates. Uh, FEMA has an app that can give you real-time alerts from the National Weather Service. You can sign up for community alerts in your area. Check with your emergency management office. Uh, you might also receive alerts from the emergency alert system or the wireless emergency alert system, and that's going to be um, evacuation notices. Then in terms of preparation, um, loading vehicles with emergency supplies, valuables, important documents, it might be good to hook up your stock trailer, um, maybe load your particularly valuable animals if you're feeling like the fire is uh, quite close. Um, if that's the case, close all doors and windows of your house, turn, turn on lights in your home, uh, barns, other structures, shut off propane tanks, Turn on irrigation if you have it. Uh, if you have time, good idea to move heavy equipment into non-vegetated areas. So those maybe those mowed pastures that you have or places that have just been grazed. Um, and then hopefully you have an idea of kind of those safe havens for livestock um, or move, put them in areas that they've recently grazed. So thinking about that fuel load, that fuel arrangement, find a place with low fuels. And then communicate. So thinking about your best evacuation routes if you need to leave quickly. So this is when communications with fire personnel can be really good. Um, but also you have a responsibility. Keep in touch with your household, workers, um, your neighbors. Um, they're probably trying to deal with their livestock as well. Like I said, distribute any maps, inventories of access points. Uh, it would be really good to have um, livestock locations for fire responders. If those folks are unfamiliar with the area, if you had like lat and long to give them, that would be 
even better. Um, but even just opening gates, removing locks could be really helpful at a time like that. Um, then the other thing is you might have too many animals to evacuate on short notice. Um, and so thinking about that feed and water for several days, um, you might take down temporary fences or other hazards that uh, may injure livestock if the fire moves through the property. And again, more communication, work with those fire responders to determine you know, how to manage your livestock um, if, if they're gonna be remaining there in place. It's important for them to know that, that they're there. And so just to wrap it up, um, fire risk reduction benefits everyone, right? Like a fire doesn't just stay on like that neighbor's property who didn't, you know, treat their fuels, manage their hazardous fuels, right? And so it can be really helpful to talk with your neighbors about maybe kind of these cross boundary fuels management needs. Um, this is a complicated thing, but we're going to keep seeing these, these fires. We're going to keep seeing large fires. And so these conversations have to happen. Uh, you might ask your soil and water conservation district, um, your FSA, your natural resource conservation service offices. A lot of them have um, programs or offerings for activities related to fire risk reduction, uh, roadside treatments. They rent equipment. They can help with seeding. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask. Right. So it looks like we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and I'm going to start by just looking in the Q&A, but thank you all for your time tonight. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'll start with Lori. I'm really sorry. I'm not familiar with the Willamette Valley. Um, I'm, I'm a rangelands person. Um, Jennifer, not to put you on the spot, but do you have any ideas for Lori about a good perennial grass for the Willamette Valley? Oh goodness! Um, this if is if getting you don't a little mind bit. To, so, sorry to cut you, Jennifer, but if you don't mind to uh, read the question for the recording because they will not show in the recording. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what's a good um, perennial grass for the Willamette Valley? And um, uh, this gets a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but um, I know that a lot of folks do perennial rye grasses. Um, and um, orchard grass in some places, fine fescues in others. Um, and because of the difference in rainfall on the west side, stuff stays a lot greener um, much later into the summer, but it certainly can get dried out. Um, I know that um, fescue and orchard grass do a little bit better in the hot, in the, in the heat um, in the late summer than say the, um, the, rye, the perennial rye grasses do. Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks for the question, Lori. Um, and so we have a second question um, from Lori. She would like to know how to thin woodlands. Um, so it you know, depends on the part of the state you're in. And so what I would recommend is uh, you may have an extension forestry agent in your county and they would certainly be able to help. They would come out to your place and, and take a look because um, it certainly would just depend on, on the site you're dealing with. Um, the other option might be your um, Natural Resource Conservation Service Office, NRCS. Um, I'm in Harney County and we currently have um, program offerings for um, forest stand management with an eye to fire risk reduction. And so some of those practices include thinning trees, but also um, implementing fuel breaks. And so you might just ask and, and find out what's available in your county. While I wait for some other questions, I'm gonna just put up this resource slide. Um, there is a lot out there. Um, it, uh, there's no shortage of advice on preparing for fire. Um, and, and so these, these first two, um, that, that FEMA one, um, this can give you just information about getting emergency notifications on your cell phone um, during fire events. Um, that second link there is how to get a fire weather forecast. And so these are particularly valuable. Um, you know, you all work outdoors. And so uh, if there is a red flag warning issued for your area, um, that might be a day to, you know, maybe not do that woodland thinning, right? Don't do not do activities that, that um, might be considered risky and um, you don't wanna start a fire on your property. 
Um, that uh, third down, so the first one with the QR code is a, um, a website where uh, the Extension Fire Program, of which I'm a part, has compiled a series of webinars and then also resources. And they are tailored for um, you know, individual things, so things you can do around your property, um, things you can do as a community, and then also with an eye toward kind of that landscape level, which really is the scale at which we're thinking about wildfire risk reduction. The second one there um, is a course developed by uh, our OSU Extension colleague, Jacob Powell, and it's specifically about um, wildfire preparedness in agriculture. And I borrowed some of his materials like that, um, taking an inventory, mapping your resources. Um, I borrowed that from his course. And so certainly something to investigate if this is a topic you're passionate about. And then that third one um, is, uh, from the National Wildfire Coordination Group. And it's just considerations um, specifically focused on um, that kind of final window um, when wildfire is threatening your property. But there's definitely more out there and, and please email me if you're um, wanting something really specific and, and maybe we can check that down together. Well, thank you very much, Kate. I think it was a great presentation. I have a lot of things in my mind right now. Um, I really like the portion you talk about grazing as a as a tool to reduce fire and fuels, right? We recently have a study with virtual fences and we were capable of reducing considerably uh, the amount of fire and fuels in specific locations, um, you know, range landscape uh, locations. So I think a lot of what we'll be hearing on the next, what we did here tonight and what we'll be hearing tomorrow in the next few days is preparing, being proactive and, and managing uh, fuels, right? So um, I just wanna say thank you one more time and appreciate having you tonight, being part of this group. I hope you can join us tomorrow. I think you have give us an amazing uh, lead for tomorrow where we're gonna talk a little bit more on preparing for fire season, considering your livestock and also how to care for those animals during fires and after when they are exposed to smoke. Uh, so I don't think we have any more questions I don't see on my side. Um, so if you guys have any other questions, you can either email me or Katie uh, in the future uh, and I'll be happy to pass along or can just email her directly. So for tomorrow night, it's, uh, oh, and Katie just uh, put her email on the chat. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so for tomorrow night, we have Jennifer Krupchenk and myself, and we'll be talking about um, evacuation and preparing and caring for livestock during wildfire season. With that, I would say thank you and good night to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.